It is an honor to be here today. I'll be honest though, when Sunir asked me, hey Lindsay, will you speak at SAS Connect? I said, you must be crazy. What do I have to share with people? Whoops. What do I have to tell with people? It's a room full of many partnerships, sales and BD people. What do I have to teach or to learn? And he said, the good news is you don't have to teach anything. We are a community of professionals who share stories. So I figured I can share my story indeed. So I'll start off by saying that my story begins in the words of David Byrne from The Talking Heads. And that question is, how did I get here? Any Talking Heads, Heads fans here? Thank you, good. It's a good read of the age of the audience as well. <laughs> um, the answer for me of how did I get here is quite simple. Curiosity led me here. And as Sunir mentioned, my story uh, doesn't start in business school. I took zero finance classes in undergrad. It starts from a place of curiosity. I studied political science. And at age 19, I decided to go to India and to really understand what the political and history landscape looked like in South Asia. Um, that fascination with India then transformed really the rest of my career. Um, I studied again there. I studied both in Rajasthan and in Hyderabad, took Hindi courses, and I wrote my thesis on the role of political rights of women in India. With that, I also had a passion for domestic politics. And so every summer I was having internships in Washington, D.C., various think tanks, foreign policy issues. And <clears throat> that's really what led to my first job. My first job was at a company called APCO Worldwide, which is a consulting firm that really sits at the intersection between business, media, and politics. Clients would hire us to help them with policy issues. Clients would hire us when they were getting sued and had political crises and PR crises to deal with. And clients were also hiring us to figure out how do they work with nonprofits on the issues that matter the most to them. A good example would be Coca-Cola figuring out its water sustainability program in places like South Asia. And during that time, if you had asked me, what do I want to be when I grow up, it was very clear. I want to be Secretary of State of the United States. And so naturally, after work, after I was finished with my client work, I would go study for the Foreign Service exam. Uh, that was a series, if you're ever familiar with how that works, it's a series, usually a year long of exams, both written and oral exams. I'm happy to say that I passed, and then I went for my security clearance. Thankfully, I also passed that. My parents were very happy about that. <laughs> and I sat on the register for, for diplomats. Basically, there's a list that the State Department has to call up for service. And I was number 37 on the economic list. And interestingly, during that time, one of my favorite ever clients, Intuit, started talking to me about a job. Intuit had hired my firm, APCO, to help them enter the Indian market and help to work, figure out how to work with accountants and small businesses. As you all will know, many of you partner with Intuit in the room. They make QuickBooks, Bint.com, and TurboTax. At that time, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton faced a budget cri crisis. The federal government shut down. Unfortunately, that has become a trend recently. And so I sat at number 37 on that list, and then I had a job offer from Intuit to go lead public policy in Asia Pacific and emerging markets. So I had this crossroads, do I wait or do I take the call, the pull to go into the tech world? I'm very happy to say that I picked the tech world. I joined into it and as I mentioned before, is really in the government space, but this is really where my interests of partnerships began. Intuit was figuring out how to work with Indian small business associations, was figuring out how to work with other tech companies around the world. And so, as a role leading policy, I was actually building a lot of partnerships with nonprofits, accountant associations, as well as other tech companies. And we sat with the government of India, both at the federal and the local level, to figure out how could we get small businesses using cloud software? How could we figure out uh, what's a smart way to deal with data flows globally? So you can imagine the issues were privacy, cybersecurity, but they were also where a lot of my passion was about financial literacy and helping small businesses manage their income. During that time, I, re I distinctly remember sitting in a meeting in Delhi with the government, specifically the Ministry of Micro, Small, and Medium Enterprises. And Facebook was with me and Google was with me because we obviously had worked together as an industry quite often. And we were talking to the, the government about cloud software and where we wanted to store our data and all of these policy issues. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm actually more interested when the minister leaves the room to talk to Google and Facebook about what tools they're building for small businesses. And really, that's the moment where I said, I may need to make a career shift. But I had zero partnership, 
zero BD, zero sales, zero engineering experience on my CV. And so I remember going to my best ever boss, Whitney McDougall, vice president of policy at Intuit, and I said, hey, I think I want to make a career change, but I'm not sure. Would you support me? And she said, well, you certainly have no experience, but if you go talk to the BD team, I'm sure they need some help. There's no one in the London office. And at that time, I was living in London. And so thankfully, the small business uh, partnerships team at Intuit said, yes, please, we desperately need international help. You're in London. Any hours you can give me to go figure out how we do deals with PayPal, Receipt Bank, uh, you know, a number of uh, other companies that many of you represent. And I said, OK, let's give it a try. Thankfully, that then led to a full-time job, and I, I shifted. I left the policy world, and I went into the partnership space. The types of partnerships that I was dealing with was figuring out how to make it easier for a small business to send an invoice and to get paid against that invoice, or to figure out how do they track their time and deal with employee management solutions. So I think T-Sheets is in the room. Those types of the partnerships were the ones that I was working on. And I'll remember, one of the deals that I was doing was a really tough deal at Intuit, because most of you will know about Intuit had a 30-year payment business, $30 billion, in fact. And I was realizing that the tech stack that Intuit had was super old. I was trying to build our business in the UK and France. And I couldn't rely on the payments business that was sitting back in Mountain View headquarters. And so I was really working on a deal um, to globalize that payment solution. And that's when I met Stripe. Stripe in 2011, I think it was, was just led by two Irish guys both under 25 years old at that time. And they were building APIs to help engineers start businesses and get paid around the world. For me, it felt revolutionary. And the moment that I went back to headquarters at Intuit and I started talking to engineers and architects, they said, oh, thank God, if you can find a deal for us to use Stripe instead of our own payments APIs, we will be so happy. And so I started to listen to more and more engineers in the company. And that's when I decided that Stripe really had something. Um, while I was working on that deal, a different part of Stripe reached out to me, actually the head of international, and said, hey, we know this is super awkward. You're finalizing a deal between Intuit and Stripe, but we'd really like you to come lead partnerships for Stripe and help us expand into new markets and really build out our API ecosystem. Obviously, that's always very dangerous as partnerships people. You will know if you're sitting at a table and something looks more attractive on the other side, you have to be really thoughtful and professional about that. Um, and thankfully, I'm happy to say that it worked out. Stripe was certainly an interesting place to be, and I admire the company today. I love watching the velocity at which they launched new products. They're solving not just payment solutions, but also how do businesses start up. So they make it a lot easier for companies to get started, get a business license, get a bank account, all without ever having to enter the United States. <clears throat> I really had no intention of leaving Stripe, but that's when Netflix knocked on my door. Now, um, if you can believe this, I didn't own a TV for about 10 years. I was a Netflix paying member for five of those years, but because I had lived all around the world, I was watching on my laptop and my mobile often. Needless to say, what Netflix had to say was really exciting because they were thinking about partnerships in a new way, partnering with companies who were often seeing them as, as a competitor and as a threat, the likes of Sky and Telefonica, which I'll talk about later. <clears throat> I think the other thing that I'd like to say, as many of you will know if you've lived overseas or you're, or you're from outside the United States, the business and professional decisions that you make are truly life-changing on your personal life as well. Um, I've had the, the great pleasure of living in places like India and the UK, obviously Washington, DC, and here I'm based in San Francisco, but I spend a lot of my time now in Amsterdam. I'm happy to say that while living overseas for Intuit, I met my husband. I also met a number of my best friends today, and so I, I'm proud to say that I feel more like a global citizen than one tied to a given country. The things that I've learned in those career decisions and in those transitions are obviously ones that you would have experienced in your own career. Any career, but especially partnerships, they're not linear. Oftentimes, we'll make lateral moves, or even we might take a step back in, in the career ladder if it's to gain to new experience, and so for me, what was driving that passion was, is the ability to connect people and ideas across borders. The other thing, like many of you people, if you come from a sales background or partnerships, there is a natural high of signing a deal. And then launching it, and then getting feedback from customers, I would argue is even better. 
The, the third theme of my career choices have started to be when I was in a certain role, it started to feel quite bureaucratic. And I realized there was a point in time where I was making more PowerPoints about deals and more PowerPoints about products than actually building those things. And for me, that's always been a signal of when it's time to move on. Lastly, I'll say when I make career decisions, Teamwork is really important to me. And teamwork looks a lot different in different companies. At Netflix, Reed, who is our CEO, we often talk about Netflix collaboration is like playing in a jazz band. There's no, correct, uh, there's no conductor. You're, you're making eye contact. You're seeing the body movement in the room. And you're making decisions as you go. I much prefer that type of collaboration where you're not forced to stay in any one lane than I do being you know, directed by a, a conductor told when I have to play, and told what instrument that I have to play. <clears throat> I'll share a few observations, and I, I suspect this will also resonate with a number of you too, and so I, I want to make sure we have enough time for Q&A so we can kind of exchange some of those stories. But the first one is that partnerships at the intersection between government, the media, and business certainly make for interesting dynamics. As you all know, the incentives of government are completely different. Oftentimes, they're short-term based on, can I get reelected? Uh, which constituents do I need to please today at this moment? They're not about maximizing profit, and they're not necessarily about maximizing the best product solution <laughs> for customers. And so, as I mentioned before, when we were working in India, for example, with a solution that Intuit had for farmers, we were trying to figure out what the monetiza monetization strategy was. It was an app called Fussel, which in, in Hindi basically represents the market, the wholesale market where farmers are trading um, fruits and vegetables. And believe it or not, Intuit was trying to solve financial management solutions for that constituency as well. Obviously, it was hard to monetize. And so we started working with government to say, well, what kind of data did you have about the wholesale price of a tomato or a banana at this market at this moment in time? And the government had a real problem distributing that data to farmers. And Intuit had built an SMS open platform to start communicating those real-time prices to farmers so they could make better decisions about where to sell their crops. And so that was where we were able to run experiments with government. And I don't think if you had asked Intuit what their strategy to distribute this product, if someone had said, yeah, we're going to work with the government, I think most people, especially the Indian government, I think most people would have told you that, uh, that you're crazy. But I'm really happy to say we learned a ton there. At the end of the day, you had to find the, the, shared, the shared goals there. The other thing that I was asked to talk about is what's been the transition from partnerships in these different environments, from policy to then small business, B2B when I was working at Intuit in the apps ecosystem, and then to Stripe, where increasingly we were building APIs that even Amazon was using when it expanded Amazon Prime in Singapore. And then now I'm on the consumer space at Netflix. I think the short answer is it's actually easy to make this transition because there are a lot of similarities. At the end of the, deal, at the, end of the day, a partnership is about finding shared value and figuring out what the true goals are then going the next level to really find out what the motivations are. I think the other thing that we realized across all these different career choices is that the product and the consumer experience has to be good. No matter how much of a rev share that you give to a reseller, if the product is not solving a real problem, you are just wasting your time. And so we really felt like those were the themes throughout all my career decisions. I would say the one thing that has been really different, though, is the decision-making process. So as many of you know, the way a small business will make a decision about which financial management software to use or what CRM tool, they're going to ask their accountant. That's why when I was working on partnerships with, Net or, excuse me, with Intuit, we were focused a lot on the accountant strategy. Now, a decision-maker at Sky, Telefonica, or T-Mobile, that decision-making process looks a lot different. And so at Netflix, we have to really think differently about how we're influencing the stakeholders in those different groups. The other big aha that I made came from a big mistake that I made. Like many of you, we learn the most from our mistakes. And I remember when I was working on a, a deal, and it was kind of a, a mix of a deal, but it also had some crisis elements. So there was a lot of stress at this time. And like many good type A BD people, I was very focused on the numbers, very focused on the timeline, and I was making sure that all of the stakeholders internally were doing what they were supposed to do. But my boss took me aside, and she said, Lindsay, I know you're going to get to the right point. 
because you're doing all the right things. Call that the what. But the how of how you're getting there, I would encourage you to think of another route. Because if right now, if you asked all the people working on this deal in the company, they would probably say that deal, oh yeah, I'm working on Lindsay's deal. But if it's Lindsay's deal, it's no one's deal. How can you think differently about influencing the engineer working on the project? How can you make sure that the salesperson feels that it is their, their deal as much as the partnerships lead? That has probably been the biggest piece of advice that stuck with me throughout all my partnerships. I have to think differently about what people's motivations are and really make sure that they feel they own the outcome, not just the person who's leading the pack. <clears throat> the other thing that I want to talk about is imposter syndrome. This seems to be a really hot topic, especially in tech and also in diversity and inclusion circles. Put simply, if you're not familiar with the term, imposter syndrome is feeling like you're not good enough to be in the room. You are not smart enough, you somehow sneaked through the back door, and you only got in because you knew people and you're really not good enough to compete. I've felt this a lot, especially as a partnerships person who's worked so cross-functionally. The salespeople see me as engineers, and when I'm in the room as the, with the engineers, they see me as BD. And sometimes I feel like I'm never deep enough in any one of those skills. I think that I would, the thing that I want to highlight here is that I'm pretty sure we all feel this. Uh, but the other thing that I would say is you don't have to solve it all. You might never be an expert in one of those fields. But follow your heart. I usually, actually used to be really nervous of the, some of the technical elements of the deals that I was working on. And I feared the moment when it got a little too deep and I had to ask an engineer. But what I did is that fear actually was intriguing to me. I wanted to understand what I didn't know. And so I started studying APIs more. I started brainstorming and whiteboarding with engineers, any engineer who would listen to me. And now I would actually argue I'm probably in my most technical role ever. <clears throat> so lean into the imposter syndrome, but also know that you're not going to fix it all in a day. The other big learning that I had was when I was living in London, launching a partnership between GoCardless, which is a recurring payment solution in Europe. They do direct debit payment. Great for subscription models. And we had worked forever because I was at Intuit and I was trying to convince the head of the payments division back in Mountain View that, hey, this payments product is a lot better than our own for recurring businesses and we need to integrate it into the QuickBooks invoicing solution. It took us forever to get this deal signed. And the moment the deal got signed, I really just wanted to pop the champagne and then probably go to bed because I haven't slept in months. But I remember my product manager partner who really taught me so much about building great experiences, he said, Grossman, Save the champagne until you have happy customers and partners. There's nothing worse than a BD person sending out an email about a signed contract because everyone else in the business rolls their eyes, including the finance people, because you haven't delivered on your numbers yet. So I no longer celebrate when the deal is signed. I only celebrate when I've got great customer feedback and good numbers on the dashboards. <clears throat> The other thing that I've learned is that I think we always think that some company does prioritization and resourcing better. Um, I am now in a company which, if you read the news, it looks like we have infinite amount of resources. But prioritization is tough everywhere. It's always um, discussion of do you do this smaller deal in the Middle East because it unlocks that region? Or do you do this bigger deal in the UK or the United States because the, the actual sheer numbers um, would move the needle globally? Your org design will help you solve this. So one of the worst things that I saw, and Intuit actually thankfully made that change, is where they were putting product managers globally, and they weren't empowering those product managers to have engineers. And actually, QuickBooks Online was a global product. And so you had these weird incentives that people wanted to build a product locally in their country, but you weren't getting the engineering resources that you needed on the platform. So they kind of had to rethink where the resources came and also where they paired engineering and product management. I mean, look, we're facing this problem right now at Netflix. There are a lot of deals coming through, and just last week we decided to make a change to how we prioritize. We said, look, some of these deals, like with the Skies and Telefonica, you need to commit to what the Christmas campaigns are. You need to align it when, when Stranger Things is coming out or when the next episode of The Crown is coming. But our engineers, they're A-B testing, and they're like, sometimes we can't even tell you what we're going to launch tomorrow. So how do you navigate that? So we started doing quarterly prioritization, and then we're also doing monthly check-ins, because as you will know, BD will come with a long list. Eh, certain percentage of those I'm pretty sure are not going to happen. 
And, and then we need to figure out and retest each month because those things will change at a very rapid pace. The other thing that I've realized is when I started managing people at, at Intuit, but also at other companies. The things that make you a great deal person are oftentimes not the same thing that make you a great people manager. And so what I mean by that is as a deal or as a salesperson or a deal person, you want to get the deal signed. You want to do it as fast as you can. You want to be aggressive in that process. But those things don't make a great manager. Um, and I'll remember we were working on a tele the Telefonica deal with, with Netflix. And usually I would go in as the people leader to figure out, OK, what deals are actually happening? And then I'll staff accordingly with my team. But I was starting to jump in on the contract process with Telefonica a bit too early, uh, you know, a bit too much, and I wasn't giving my team enough time to jump in and to lead that themselves. And so at Netflix, we have a really big open feedback culture where people can tell their managers, like, hey, don't appreciate what you're doing. At other companies, you might be scared to tell that to your manager, um, but it happens all the time. And he said, look, I really appreciate everything you put in the comments of this, this negotiation are spot on but I would prefer to have a little bit more time to do that so that other people see me as the leader, not you. I said, that is amazing feedback. And so I had to suppress the deal version of Lindsay, lean back and really make sure that my team was driving that and thinking about the strategic questions in the same way that I would want them to, but I didn't have to be front and center. The other thing that I learned from managing people is that, you know, like BD, you're always looking for the next deal. We're always looking for the next great Stunning colleague. That's what we call it at Netflix. I actually came to find that I love recruiting. I love hiring people. I also realize that these things are not transactional. So oftentimes I'm talking to someone who may not join where I am, maybe another year, even sometimes two years. But I've really appreciated taking a long view <clears throat> to this perspective. And I think the other thing that I want to share is around diversity and inclusion. We talk about it as if it's this other thing as an industry. But I've actually really seen this be critical to the deal process and the types of partnerships that we were doing. So when I was recruiting at Netflix, I was very clear to not go look for people who had, you know, had worked at Stripe or had done all the same type of experience that I had. I wanted to look at people who had worked in other countries, who had, you know, more, let's say, more technical skills than I did, or in some case, more sales experience than I did. And so even as, as a hiring manager, I had to say, what is my unconscious bias? Things that even I don't necessarily know but are happening in the recruiting process. So one decision that I made was actually I worked with my recruiting partner and said, any candidate who's a female or a person of color, I'm doing the first screening because I don't want there to be any chance of unconscious bias slipping through the recruiting process. You know, lots of recruiters are talking to people. I don't want to risk it. It's, it's important enough to Netflix and our bottom line. And so I think little things like that, plus also building your, <clears throat> when you're recruiting, you're building your panel, like the people at your company who are going to judge this candidate. Make sure that's diverse. Make sure that you have a good sample set of different experiences at your company so you can really get the best answers and, and give that candidate a fair chance. Lastly, I'm going to close by telling you what's different about Netflix. There were some things that I had to unlearn, um, and there's some new perspectives that I've gained in the last year and a half. So the first thing I'll do is give you a little bit of context about what my team does. So I'm on the partnerships team at Netflix. At the end of the day, we want to make it easy to discover, to sign up, and to enjoy Netflix in our partnership channels. And we want to make sure that our partners are both increasing their customer base, retaining them, and driving, the, driving higher ARPU. Who are our partners? They're telcos like T-Mobile. So if any of you have the family plan, with T-Mobile, you may know that you can get Netflix included without paying a dime. <clears throat> My team built that. So <clears throat> we want to make sure that if you are a Sky customer in the UK, you turn on your set-top box. It's really easy to sign up with Netflix. I'd like a quick show of hands. How many people have ever turned on their TV and had to sign up for something, whether it be Netflix, Hulu, or something else? And you had to enter your email and create a password and then you had to take out your wallet and use a remote control to enter a 16-digit credit card with just little arrows on a remote control. Raise your hand. How frustrating has that been? Raise your hand if you think it's frustrating and you want to throw your remote control across the living room. My team is getting rid of that. 
we said, hey, why do we need to ask people to create a Netflix password on a television? That sucks. Let's send them an email and have them do that on their computer and their mobile phone, because it's a lot easier than a remote control on a television. Hey, Sky, in the, which is Europe's largest TV provider, is really thinking about how they bring in new customers and retain the ones that they have. They also really like Netflix content. So why don't we build a bundle whereby Netflix is included in the core TV package of Sky? And how can we also make that experience really joyful? There's nothing worse of you know, buying a television and getting six months free of Netflix and having to take out a piece of paper and enter this code. So we started doing things like codeless redemption. You click a button, and by the power of the APIs that our team built, Sky can tell us, hey, yes, that customer is eligible for Netflix, and you get to bank that credit in your Netflix account without ever looking at a code, without ever looking at a piece of paper. Those are the types of things that we're doing at Netflix. The other thing that we do is when we think about the partnerships, what are the main goals? We care about incremental subscribers, so people who would not have otherwise come to Netflix.com in our organic channels. And we also want to make sure that they retain. We're not interested in going to do deals with telcos that say they can bring us a lot of quick wins and a ton of new customers in the first billing period. I want to know if they're going to pay after subsequent periods, month after month. The other thing that I'll talk a little bit about is the Netflix culture. So a few years ago, we published what's called the Netflix culture deck. And a lot of people, we were kind of weirded out because it's quite different than a lot of other companies. But they're also quite curious. So I'll tell you how this has showed up in my partnerships and in my career. So the first one is freedom and responsibility. It sounds a little bit like the American citizenship test. Uh, like, but I tell you, it's, it's more interesting than that. The idea is that we hire people who are already experts in their career. We don't hire early career people or people out of college. The, the idea is that you, you're best in your class, we hire the A team, and we give you a ton of freedom. We hope that you've made mistakes some, somewhere else and that you'll be successful at Netflix. But you also have a lot of responsibility with that freedom. So I can make decisions without any approvals, but I should probably be responsible to get feedback from engineering and the marketing team before I do a big deal with Deutsche Telekom, for example. The other one that I really love, which is quite interesting in a partnership dynamic, is what we call highly aligned and loosely coupled. This idea here is that I don't have to get contracts even approved by legal, which is insane by most company standards. But if I'm really aligned with what the legal team wants and what they care about and what the big issues are versus the small potatoes, then we can stay highly aligned, but also loosely coupled. We're able to move free without having all these bureaucratic approval processes. And that's what leads to the third part of the culture, which I love, people over process. Uh, there is this natural, like, it's, like, it's almost like an allergy to process at Netflix because we think that it slows us down. Now, sometimes process can be good. For example, the prioritization process that I talked about. We needed a little bit more structure to make decisions globally. But every time we put in a new idea, we had to really question ourselves, is it going to slow down our people? Is it going to frustrate really creative people who want to make their own decisions quickly? That's the other thing we talk about. This plays out in management relationships with your direct reports, as well as your team. We want to give everybody context. So when people join Netflix, they're really shocked about the level of data that is available to them as an employee. I can go to the content side of the business and say, hey, how's this title performing, even though it really doesn't have to do in my job. But it helps me give context, get the context to make better business decisions. So the idea here is that you give really smart, experienced people context, you give them freedom, don't control them, and that they will make good decisions. I'll finish by saying, to talk a little bit about the experimentation culture. At Netflix, we A-B test everything. I learned a little bit about A-B experimentation from Scott Cook when I was at Intuit. We did things, what's called like painted doors. If you're going to offer a new payment method, you know, put it up online before you actually build it. See if people start to enter their credit card. If they do, that means they actually want your product. We do that at Netflix, but it's a lot more sophisticated in terms of its back end and rigor. So Netflix built really a data and a, a data science team before it was kind of trendy in the 
the industry, so the infrastructure to, to test new product ideas is, is truly joyful. So if I have Sky, let's say our Virgin Media, saying, hey, Lindsay, I want to try out this new product experience. We think it's going to drive acquisition, but it's a little bit different than something you've done before. I said, OK, cool. Let's talk about what you think the goals are. I'll tell you what I think is meaningful enough to warrant a test. We'll run that test. I have very low friction to get the engineers and the data team that I need. And then we'll make a decision once we have the data. The reason why I wanted to end on experimentation is because I think it nicely sums up the career, transi the, the career progression that I've had. You take, you take experiments. I didn't really know if I'd like partnerships in BD. I said to my government affairs manager, what if I want to come to policy? Come back, and I don't like it. She said, great. You'll come back to policy, and you'll be a better government affairs person because you understand how the business works. So same thing. If this product doesn't succeed, OK, we change it. We do something else. Nothing is so much of a trap door that you can't get back out. And so when people ask me, hey, what's next? What's your next career experiment? The short answer is, I don't know. But the longer answer is, I can tell you what are going to be my guiding principles. The first one is, it has to be a product-driven company. The second one is, it has to be international. I really thrive on helping companies enter new markets. And the third one is, I have to do it with people who are collaborative, fast moving, and hate bureaucracy as much as I do. With that said, I'm happy to take some Q&A. <clears throat> well, what a journey. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your story. What I loved, there's so many things about your career that I love, which is, uh, why I had to have you come. Uh, but the fact you started politics, I also did a stint in politics, is where I learned marketing. And it's funny how much it applies to partnerships, actually, when you do it. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, could you share your experience about how your experiences in politics has helped you with partnerships? I think it all comes down to understanding people's motivation. So, if you're working with a member of Congress, you need to understand, like, when she is going to get reelected. What are the issues in her constituency? And then try to figure out how your business goals align with that. Same thing in a partnership. When we went to go do this, the deal with Sky at Netflix, it was, it was very nerve-wracking for a lot of people. Sky was very nervous that a lot of people were going to get Netflix and then cut the cord, cancel their Sky subscription, and only have Netflix, right? But once we started to learn a little bit more about Sky's business, we figured out, actually, there is a way for us to live in your ecosystem and for you to also drive upsell. And so I guess that goes back to it. Like, understand what the core mo motivations are and then figure out where you can solve it. Yeah, other questions for Lindsay? Must be one. Over there. Yeah, hey, Lindsay. Um, well, first, thanks for the T-sheet shout out earlier. No but I, uh, I'm curious. How do you think about um, the contrast of going deep with a couple partners versus having quite a bit of breadth with partners but not going as deep? How do you balance that? How do you make those trade-offs? That is a great question. We are literally talking about it right now at Netflix. So I think in the beginning of whatever your partnership program is, sometimes you just need to go broad. Uh, we, we call it like, it's basically land grab, right? You have a map on the, on the slide and you figure out how many deals you can get around the globe. Because many times we were going into countries we really had no idea about. So we said, let's go broad first. You do that for a year. You build the API so that hopefully that scale becomes easier. And then you, you have a period of review, like which deals are providing value and which ones are not. So, and I think once you figure out the ones that are not, you really have to ask why they are not. Is it because your product's not ready for that country? Is it because that partner's sales channels just really don't align with your core product strategy? Or is it because they're just like a really rubbish partner? Um, but really understand the why before you act on that. So now my team at Netflix, we're going a bit deeper. So we're starting to get partnerships with more and more of the big telcos and TV companies that we want to work with. But we've really just skimmed the surface in some of those deals. So we, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example with, with Comcast. So Comcast, if you have a, the Xfinity box at your house, for a while, you could just turn it on. Netflix app was on the set-top box. And you could sign up. And with a click of a button, you could put it on your Com Comcast bill. Beautiful. No credit card pulling out of your pocket. 
And, but now we said, let's go deeper with Comcast. Comcast said, hey, Netflix is not as scary as we once thought it was. They're actually driving our business value. Let's do something deeper. So now Netflix is bundled in a lot of, of Comcast's core TV offerings. We just launched in the West Coast uh, two days ago. So you know, I think that's a good example of start broad, but then go deep later. Yeah, great, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, question about the how your strategy changes based on the strength of the brand. So Intuit is a global brand, not as strong as Netflix. Netflix is a very strong brand. Stripe was not as strong. Mm -hmm. um, how did, did that impact your strategy, your conversations with partners, if at all? Great question. Um, I'll give you a good example. So I think in parts in the US, Intuit's brand was strong. But when I was in Europe and like in India, nobody knew Intuit. And so, Zero was obviously building up their business at that time as well. And so I think part of the way that we differentiated ourselves in the new markets is like, hey, we're willing to innovate and to test and to share data probably in a more collaborative way than some of the old school big companies. So that became the differentiator. Same thing with Stripe. Um, I led our partnerships with Alibaba and with Tencent, which owns WeChat. Many of you will know if you're familiar with Asia. Huge giants. Like, I don't think I've ever worked with a bigger company in the world. And they were like, who's this Stripe company? But the good news is we had huge VCs behind us. And um, you know, people like Mike Moritz, who uh, you know, comes from the VC world and very well known. So he helped open doors for us. But then again, we had to deliver on innovation. We had to show them that we could build a better product for them that was going to make them more competitive globally. Does that answer your question? OK. Thanks for sharing, Lindsay. Great, great journey, and looking forward to seeing what you do next. Um, I'm kind of curious if you have any regrets looking back of kind of what you could have done. I'm just kind of curious. You know, you're you're not very big on bureaucracy and very big on getting things done quickly. Any thoughts on thank God for the government shutdown way back when, when you were sitting at 37? Are there any regrets about it? What, what, would, what would the Foreign Service look like to you now? It's a good question. I definitely think of it. A lot of people are like, don't look back. That's a waste of time. I think looking back is, is interesting because the way you look back is different depending on where you are in the current state. Um, I still think about like, how do I enter politics? So you know, it might be uh, a different route than it was back then. Um, without getting too political and like revealing my political uh, affiliations, I do think it would be harder to be a diplomat in today's political uh, environment. So I am kind of glad that I'm not sitting in an embassy in Pakistan right now um, with some of the decisions that are being made. So um, I'm also really glad that I joined tech. I had, I literally knew nothing about tech when I was in the consulting world. And Intuit and a few other tech companies really helped me realize that, oh, there's a place for a lot of different types of people in technology, not just engineers. Other question? I, saw, I laugh when you put up the imposter syndrome slide <laughs> because everybody, I think everybody in this room experiences too much to know as a partnership person. Yeah. You're dealing with so much risk. Uh, what does it look like? How did you break through like that, that, that thought pattern? Because I, I don't seem like you feel that way anymore. Well, I think we all have it. I had a little bit this morning on the, the lift here, right? <laughs> like, why am I speaking at this conference? <laughs> so it still comes up, right? Um, but I think that I, you kind of just have to look in the mirror and be like, OK, I don't know this thing. I'm totally fine to say I don't know it. I think part of that is suppressing your ego. I'm actually, if you ask my team what it's like to work with me, they'll be like, Lindsay will always admit when she's wrong. I am. Like, why wouldn't I want to admit that I'm wrong? We all just learn something. I learn something. So I just like being not afraid to admit that I don't know something. Uh, and then also being curious. Like I said, there's so many. I have a couple of engineers and product managers in my career who are truly almost like a, a virtual board of advisors for me because they were really patient with me when I was leaving government affairs and really knew nothing about product and engineering. And they were patient with me and taught me <laughs> more about that. <clears throat> well, I mean, I really appreciate you coming. And I think let's give her a good round of applause and say why she came. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs>